So, Gabby, Kenny, you're both the two, well, the two newest coaches at RTS, but uh, you're not exactly new to coaching. Um, you've been doing this for a little while. And, uh, you know, one of the reasons we wanted to have you guys on the team is because you've got uh, experience and, and really some, you've got your own thoughts around training and around coaching and stuff like that. And I think it makes for some really interesting conversation, which is part of the reason we wanted to do a podcast today. Um, but maybe a good way to get, kind of get a start on this is, uh, a little bit of a quick background. Um, so maybe Kenny, if we can start with you, um, just kind of what's been, what's kind of the quick history on, on your coaching practice lately? Well, I have been coaching for a few years. I kind of started with the Badger powerlifting team and was just kind of helping out, uh, not coaching individuals, but just kind of helping out in around 2019. Uh, and then that kind of just kept developing as I pursued my degree in kinesiology and then my degree that I'm finishing up now in physical therapy and taking a larger role with the, the team where I'm now the head coach and have been coaching individuals for a few years. Uh, and just enjoyed it more and more and like helping people both, you know, when we have a, you know, 20 people go to a local meet and uh, managing all of that versus, you know, taking some of the higher level lifters to collegiate nationals and helping them through there and perform to the best of their abilities and worrying about, uh, you know, placing or records and all that sort of thing. Uh, it's just been a lot of fun to have that background uh, in collegiate lifting and and see how that compares to uh, the, I guess, that team focus versus individual focus as well. Yeah. Yeah. So really a, a lot of kind of on the ground, uh, practical uh, experience. I, that was kind of part of, part of my early coaching development too, is coaching in a university setting. And I think there's uh, uh, a lot of benefit to it. And I know that, so there's that aspect and then also, you know, we've had some really interesting conversation around training tactics and things like that. And I know uh, John has you know, mentioned the same thing in uh, you and he uh, working together for a while. Uh, so, Gabby, can you kind of do the same thing? Uh, give us a quick background on on your coaching experience and just uh, what your coaching development yeah, so, over the um... last... Some For period context, of time. I'm, uh, I'm located in Luxembourg. So for some people that don't know where that is, um, because like funny story, uh, recently I saw a story from Sean Riega saying that Luxembourg isn't a real country. Uh, it's where the IPF president lives. Uh, so Luxembourg is uh, located right in the middle between uh, Germany, Belgium and uh, France. So I started coaching in Luxembourg uh, three years ago. And um, I was able to, um, as I did, two internships in uh, two gyms in, in Belgium, uh, powerlifting gyms. And uh, I also used to train uh, from time to time in those gyms and was able to build some really cool relationships with uh, Belgian powerlifters. So over time, I, um, I was able to, uh, to coach more Belgian powerlifters. Um, from time to time, more and more clients came to me. I guess word of mouth just did its magic. Uh, and yeah, so, and I, at the same time, I also got uh, welcomed in, in the Belgian powerlifting community and uh, was also able to do a few competitions over there. And uh, yeah, it's pretty cool. So now I have a few clients from Belgium and uh, Luxembourg. And yeah, ever since I, I joined uh, Reactive Training Systems, now I'm also able to to gain new athletes from all over the world, which is really cool. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And I know that, you know, I would say kind of the same thing. We've had several very interesting uh, training conversations and uh, it's always interesting to, to hear your take on like training tactics. You know, you've got um, perspectives of both an athlete and a coach and, um, you know, you bring a lot of emphasis on communication to the table. So um, just kind of wanted to get a quick 
introduction uh, in here, you know, this being our, our first uh, podcast on uh, on the RTS podcast together. Um, so kind of it gives you an introduction to, to our audience and kind of lays uh, some of the groundwork for um, what we're going to be talking about today. But um, incidentally, you both have been active recently coaching at uh, at some pretty significant competitions. So, um, Gabby, maybe uh, we, we could hear from you first. Uh, just kind of what's the in-person coaching been like lately? I, mean, I, I suppose game day coaching to Man, use it's the, really the awesome. common term these like, days. Handling, um, like I've uh, the first competition where I've handled was in uh, in Luxembourg at the Luxembourgish Nationals. Uh, I was able to ha- help over there, um, one athlete, and uh, most of my competitions where I've handled were in Belgium, actually. So mostly on a region regional level, but uh, also um, at national level. So the most recent competition where I um, where I handled was two weeks ago which was actually an, from an athlete uh, from the strength guys, so not an athlete that I actually coach. Uh, and I really love handling because I get to share those awesome moments with athletes, uh, even even though I don't personally coach them. So this is something I really enjoy. Uh, I know that not every um, coach is also uh, like also enjoys handling, but it's something that I really like, although it's... Uh, it's a lot of work, um, especially when I uh, when I go to Belgium. I have to drive for a long time, um, drive for them back. Maybe also stay over at an hotel. But at the end of the day, it's it's definitely worth it because I get to to experience all of those awesome moments. Especially like when when it's one of my personal athletes, because like you work towards that one day, and then when you get to actually experience all of the the gains, the PRs, those, all of those emotions, it's, it's so much different than just looking at it behind a screen. Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, I, I find it hard to imagine not enjoying that, se- that setting, at least to some degree. It, that is kind of, part of the reason to be a, a sport coach to begin with is to do a sport. Right. But I don't know. I, so I'm right there with you. I really enjoy the, the, uh, um, like the, the game day aspect of it. It's, um, not a huge time component of what we get to do, but it's, it's very significant. And I know Matt Carey talks about this a lot about how, you know, if you were going to do, uh, one thing or, or if you were going to focus on like one area that can have like the biggest like, short-term impact then you know improving your your game day execution is probably the main thing for for most people you know and then the the training stuff is obviously like the biggest training narrative ever but um, it's definitely more of a longer term time investment yeah yeah, the competition is like the culmination of all the efforts that you put in in your training. And as a coach, it's it's a really cool opportunity to come alongside the athlete and to help them sort of realize all that work. And so, you know, also as a coach, yes, you write training, the, the athlete has to execute. But game day, you can, and to steal a word from Mac Airy, engineer outcomes. You can engineer success for your lifter. You can help put them in the best light possible to showcase their abilities and showcase all the work that they've put in. And so I concur with, uh, with you, Gabby, that it's really exciting. It's exciting to be present with your athlete or even someone else's athlete. Like, uh, there was a, a meet, a, a nationals, a USA powerlifting nationals that I went to where I didn't have any of my own athletes. I had everybody else's athletes that I was handling for the team. And I was just as excited as if it was an athlete that I was coaching. You know, it was, it was exciting to be back there and hear the athlete's goals and to talk through like what it meant to them. And then also to see them do that, you know, to have somebody hit a PR or to hit a total or to take a placing and to come run off and like high five or hug, you know, or whatever it is, you know, you do 
whatever your celebration victory is, you know, um, it's cool to see that. It's cool to be part of that. And so I can identify with that, Gabby. Do you think that that's why you invested in your like education in the IPF for like coaching? Yes. So you, you did I take was recently, level that two, was in December, you? I um, flew to Sweden to take the IPF course, um, mainly because I have to do a bunch of um, uh, workshops for my university in order to uh, also finish my degree. So at the same time, I was like, let's just do powerlifting workshop because um, I can learn a lot from them. And uh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. I uh, also did that because I also want to provide a better service, um, especially when going to competitions, because there are so many rules. And as a coach, it's uh, like you have to know the rules, you know, that it's a no go if you don't know what's going on, if you don't know why uh, a lifter didn't uh, like got a certain red light. So that's why I went there. Did you find it challenging at all? Or what, I suppose maybe a better question is like, what challenges do you find uh, when you're coaching an athlete in competition that maybe you didn't um, help prepare for that's that That's a really good question. One of the challenges, um, which are also limitations um, in online coaching that I... Um, that I saw whenever I was uh, at the competitions to handle my own athletes was that, especially those that I don't regularly see, you don't really know how their warm ups, what their warm ups look like, unless they um, they sent you videos um, beforehand. So it's um, after some time you definitely know like what's um, how certain intensity ranges what they look like. So. As you get closer to the last warm up, you definitely know what's going on. But it's uh, it's really cool to see also how they warm up um, and the whole energy. Um, sometimes you don't really sense the energy um, over like via online coaching. So um, maybe they uh, they show up to have a very different energy than what you expect. So you really have to go with the flow there. So these are um, th these are things that could be challenging. Yeah, that come to that come to mind. Yeah. yeah. So, go ahead. I was gonna um, also loop in Kenny for a second because you know Kenny, you experienced that, but also on a like really big scale because you know, the powerlifting club that you're a part of is a lot of members, right? It's like something like seventy members, isn't it? Yeah, we're up to about to like pushing upper 80s right now. Oh wow! So, uh, so you have a lot of members, and you put you know put on meets. The team that you're part of, you you guys actually host meets. You send athletes to meets, so you get to be part of a lot of athletes' journeys. Do you do you have the same sort of perspective that you know it's exciting on game day to kind of see the athletes' nerves and interests and energy? Oh yeah. I, uh, I love game day coaching for that reason. There's like, everybody brings a whole different kind of energy to, you know, meet day than what they've been preparing for. And it is different to see, like we, we hosted our own meet in late March and we had about a dozen of our athletes compete there. And most of them have no coach. They've been running some template or some self-directed programming. And that has its own challenges as far as kind of setting expectations for what they can hit and how to approach attempt selection or do they need to change something last second that they didn't know that their thumb had to go around the bar or something that has its own you know, uh, line to walk as far as like, hey, we, we need to change this and I think it's going to impact your, your numbers. But that like it's still so rewarding to do all of that even though it is a lot of like running back and forth like sometimes it's one athlete goes out and you're like yelling go five across the the platform because <laughs> they have to write it like, tell the scorers table while your next athlete is going out and you have to get them to be prepared and you're checking to see if the weight's loaded like correctly and if there's you know any sort of delay because it's a smaller meet uh you know all of that is a very different kind of uh, stress than uh, a higher level like collegiate nationals but it's still 
a whole lot of fun. It, it, so it's really interesting here. So we um, kind of got uh, both of you guys with uh, similar experiences where uh, you can be in this environment where you're handling somebody in competition that you haven't necessarily prepared for that competition. Um, I think there's maybe some misunderstanding on what the most important like, variables are that need individualization in that setting. I, I think what a lot of athletes think is that, you know, the coach needs to, to, you know, know me, know what my lifts look like um, so that we can pro properly, you know, select attempts and kind of gauge the third attempt. And I would say there's a little bit of that, you know, like that, that is a thing. And, and sometimes people are more of an outlier than others, but um, also I, th I don't think it's quite as varied as maybe some people think, you know, for most people there, you know, there's the, the Owen Hubbards of the world who can grind out anything that you give them. Uh, and the, the first attempt looks grindy and you go, I can't believe that you're going to go up from that, but he does and then makes the lifts, but those are not super common, right? Most of the time, first attempts look generally like first attempts and you can come in somewhat blind. It's better if you're not blind, but you could come in off the street and do a decent job of attempt selection for most people. You know, I would say probably the bigger variable here is just kind of what sort of tone does the athlete respond well to like from a, a psychological standpoint to, to help, uh, really bring about the best performance that's available to them. Has that been uh, the same experience that you guys have had or, uh, or so do you see things a bit Considering the last competition where I handled uh, Dosha, so an athlete that I don't uh, coach myself, I uh, got to experience this, uh, which was also a fir the first time I actually handled an athlete that wasn't mine. And um, during the warm up, so for, for background um, context, she actually had a car accident uh, two weeks prior to the competition, which, uh, which affected uh, her hips and uh, back as she um, felt stiffness. So she wasn't really able to complete the uh, comp prep as uh, expected. And then during the warm ups, I um, like, although we talked beforehand about what she needs. And she told me, yeah, I really need uh, someone to just like load the bar and just give me signs. Like, don't talk to me. I will put my headphones on during the whole, um, during the whole warm up. So, but then I, I actually sensed that she started to get really anxious and also the warm ups moved fairly heavy. And I didn't know if I should, uh, like what I should really do at this point, because I didn't want to like make her insecure about it um, but at the same time I also uh, had to trust my own intuition and actually got um, like my um, suspicion got uh, confirmed during the first warm-up as it moved pretty heavy uh, so we had to more or less deviate from the game plan but during the warm-ups I started to talk to her because I could also see that she started to seek like communication and um I just had to trust my own intuition and be because like based on what I saw on Instagram, like her energy and also whenever I met her, uh, when I was training in Belgium, like she's, she, she always came across as super confident, which she wasn't in warm up, although she's a super good athlete. So I just told her, you have to remember who you actually are. Like, although these circumstances, uh, have like those things have happened now, and you can't control them. Remember that you are a good athlete. You are the baddest bitch and you know it. So when you walk on the platform, just remember that. And I think like those are really the words that she that she needed. And uh, yeah, so you just sometimes have to deviate from from the game plan and just trust your own intuition, even though you're not completely sure, um, which you can never be because you don't really know the athlete. But yeah, you really have to trust your own intuition. Yeah. Yeah. There's not a lot of time for trial and error in a competition setting, right? Yeah. You've got to make a decision and, and go with it. It's definitely a, 
that's a time for leadership qualities to really come through and shine. You know, is, is there a better, uh, a better setting for that than competition? Yeah. And I think it's really neat that you picked up on some of the, like we call them often the soft skill stuff, how you picked up on that. It's not your athlete. You don't have that relationship that you've built over time with them. You only have the casual encounters, the things you've seen, but you picked up on something. You had your feelers out and you were paying attention to how that lifter was responding to the environment, what's going on with their body language, how they're moving, facial cues, just all those things. And it's so important because as a coach, what you say matters, you know, game day, it matters. If you were to take that same approach and you talk to another athlete that is internally trying to calm themselves down, that might have actually been a bad tactic, right? Because that could have pushed the athlete to become more nervous. So like I often say, my job game day is to be a chameleon for what that athlete needs, right? Is to like, how can I be the thing that they need to execute on the platform with the best degree of confidence and certainty? And how do I engineer that process? So for some athletes, yeah, it's a smacking on the back. You know, it's the let's go, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, all the gym memes, it's that. And for other athletes, you know, it's, it's the just keeping them calm. Tell them the least amount possible, you know, talk about something completely different or don't talk to them at all. Let them keep their headphones on. Um, I think it's really cool, Gabby, that you were a chameleon in that moment and were able to do that. And like, I'm thinking now to Kenny, like, how do you do that on a scale? <laughs> like where you have that many people that you're handling? Like, do you have tactics for that? Like how you can read people and figure out what they need? A lot of it. Uh, I don't think I could do it all same day. I try to talk to like when we have those dozen athletes, it's like the week of, I'm like, how's it going? And what are you expecting? What do you want? What role do you want me to play? Like, like you were saying, John, like be trying to be a chameleon and, and give the lifter what they, they need. Uh, so a lot of that happens beforehand, which is good uh, and kind of essential because it lets me play the role or, have somebody else help them. Like we're, we're fortunate to have a, lar a large enough team where people make, you know, friendships and I can, you know, get some help from somebody that just like wants a friend to be there in their corner and, and go, okay, Hey, they look great for your, your, you know, you're killing it or whatever. Uh, and that helps distribute the the burden a little bit there. It's also advantageous that we get in-person practices a couple times a week. And most of the time when we have competitors that are, are going to meets, I've, I've seen them at practice. They've had questions for me. We've talked and I kind of understand how they approach training, what their thought process is, or if they might need some direction uh, in, in one area more than others. And that helps me out quite a bit. For athletes that I coach individually, I'll usually, we'll have like a longer conversation about how their training has looked, what we are both expecting, and I'll directly ask them, like, what do you, what do you want from me? What, what do you need from me on game day so that you feel the most supported and that I'm not throwing you off? Because it'd be the worst thing for me to get in the way of, of their execution. And sometimes that's not a question that my lifters have ever thought about before. They're just like, oh, I've, I've seen people just get, you know, smacked in the face and then they go out. Isn't that just what we do? <laughs> and it, it doesn't have to be. Uh, and it can change even for lifters over time. Like I, I had a lifter compete this collegiate nationals. I think it was his fourth. And the, like the first, you know, few times, the first like several meets that we had together, it was hype me up as much as possible. I am going to put the ammonia as far up my nose as possible and just full send and now it's a little bit more like hey we've been really working on on me being patient with this this lift or these like particular cues and it's really helping the consistency of my top end please remind me of that and i'll take care of the amount of pipe that i need and it worked great it, it was a, a lot better experience 
uh, for that lifter. Yeah, definitely. When you can work with somebody, when you do have uh, a little bit more training history with somebody, then man, it, it opens up your options so much more and, and really enhances the value that you can bring there. Um, you know what they've been working on, what they've been struggling with, and also how to best how to best uh, deal with the issues. Like some people, you know, do really well with certain cues, uh, and, but for other people that might take them out of their element a little bit or when and how you say these things is, is important, you know, and it's difficult even to teach. I think just that the details do seem to matter quite a bit, you know, that, uh, it, it's kind of even a not so much what you say, but how you say it scenario in, in a lot of cases, you know, um, I'm thinking back to my last competition, you know, like we could talk about the things that Susie did uh, when she was handling me, which I, I was more stressed at that competition than normal. We did a podcast about it uh, before, so maybe I won't you know, kind of go for for the full story, but um, I was definitely more stressed in that situation than normal. Um, but like I could imagine, you know, somebody doing the same types of things as what Susie did, but if it wasn't done with the kind of skill or, or the kind of the background relationship that, uh, that we had there, uh, my perception of it might've been quite a bit different, you know, um, for one, you know, one of the things that was happening is like some, just a little bit of casual conversation. Cause I was more nervous than usual. And, uh, she was just kind of trying to be a little bit of a distraction there. Um, which, in the moment I found to be a little bit irritating, but it's because I know her and I know that she's good at what she does. I trust her. And I know that she's not distracted. You know, I, I could tell that she's doing this for me. It's not, you know, she's not bored and just looking for a little conversation, you know, um, which, you know, somebody else who I don't have that sort of background with, uh, I may not have, made that as my, my initial assumption. So, um, it, it is a lot easier when you've got more to lean on. Um, you know, even, you know, that a particular athlete has issues with depth and you know, the right thing to say to them, to remind them of this at the right time, but not in a way that will cause like a degradation in but confidence. You or also, um, lines. you were also so, dealing with an injury hmm right before the competition. So did you feel um, that you needed, th like that you had different needs during the competition compared to the usual competitions? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. It, it wasn't typical. I mean, so I've done three competitions since I've kind of come back to competing and the first two have been very casual. Um, I've had a handler in both, both of the first two competitions, but uh, I was pretty low pressure. Um, and I didn't feel particularly nervous about it. You know, I mean, even though the, it's only been a handful since I've come back, there is a much longer competition history there. So like walking myself through a, a competition day is not, not, it's familiar you know, um, but you, you're absolutely right. Like in the, uh, at nationals, since I was dealing with the injury, um, the needs were different and had to be kind of adjusted to, uh, kind of right there on the spot. We didn't, we didn't even know that this was a sure thing, you know, until 48 hours, uh, prior to, to competing. So, um, yeah, it was definitely different and, I do think that happens sometimes, you know, you have an athlete who's never competed at a certain level, be it a national level or something like that. And, you know, well, this one hits a little different or they're coming in off of an injury or they have a particularly difficult weight cut or maybe squats go bad and they're like one for three on squats. 
this is a different scenario because hopefully that doesn't happen to you often. <laughs> so you've got to be able to adjust and how do you kind of regain your focus for the bench press? You know, it, a lot of this is on the athlete, but the coach can say and do things that are really helpful um, in those scenarios. Ross has a, a story that he tells about Susie as well, about how he had a scenario that I, I want to say it was just that same kind of scenario where he went one for three in squats or something like that, missed some squats and was feeling some kind of way about it and was uh, upset. And Susie, you know, came back there and said, you know, I'm going to go to go get a drink of water. And when I come back, you're going to be finished with whatever this is that you're feeling right now. And we're going to move on to the bench. And, you know, Ross is the kind of guy that responds really well to that sort of directness and it worked, you know, so just kind of a little relationship goes a long way, but, you know, at the same time, so, you know, if you don't have that luxury, uh, some empathy and uh, emotional intelligence goes a long way, <laughs> just the same. Definitely. But I also had uh, recently had uh, a similar situation with uh, one of three squats. And that was with one of my athletes who um, actually came to me end of last year. He wanted to qualify in uh, for Worlds in the 74. So he wanted to actually go down in a weight class. Although I didn't really recommend that to him as he, um, like his bench was really lacking behind and his bench was also the determining factor whether he would qualify in the end or not. Um, so I was like, man, you're really not making that really easy for me, um, going down in a weight class and expecting to gain like 10 or 15 kilos in a bench um, within a few months. So then he had to do um, regionals uh, in February so in order to qualify in the 74 for the nationals, um, which was two weeks ago in Belgium um, in order to qualify for Worlds. So we um, took like the first competition in the 74 as a test. Uh, he also was planning to um, to do two attempts in squats and deadlifts just to have a heavier opener, just to get uh, the feeling for um, what it's going to be like uh, at the nationals. And he actually ended up with uh, one, at one successful attempt in squats because his opener was way too way too grindy he failed the second uh, the second attempt and then um as he was dealing with his like the consequences of the weight cuts and like real realization kicked in he sat there um in between squats and bench and he was he was already like thinking about what's going to happen in a few months he was like yeah um i don't think i'm going to continue in the 74 so like what do you do when an athlete like isn't present anymore? Like you're still at the competition. You still have to do two more lifts, right? So I really needed to sit down with him and tell him, listen, we still have to do bench. Then we do deadlifts. Like first we do this lift then we do that lift. And we, we don't talk about anything, uh, what, what's happening after that right now. So that's just focused step by step. And then at the end, he ended up um, doing a national record in deadlifts with 271.5 kilos. So it was a huge win. Uh, we still learned our lesson and we um, decided to go up in a weight class now. So it's great. We still uh, we still had a win. So although you mess up in the first attempt, um, in the first uh, yeah. lift, I know that it can really have a detrimental uh, effect on on how you're going to approach the next lift, but it's really important to stay in the game and stay co uh, focused because nothing is lost until like the last attempt is made. For sure. Yeah. I, I can feel that pull for myself as an athlete too, that, you know, I, that's my natural tendency is to want to look ahead and even get back into planning mode because there's some comfort there, but that doesn't mean it's the right decision. You know, the, uh, staying focused and staying engaged is, especially in that setting, is absolutely the right call. Uh, like you said, I, I mean, it, this is a good example, too, of uh, 
staying engaged and the story not being over. You know, you can't even necessarily tell the full arc of things just by how the squats went. You know, that's why you, you have to finish the competition, you know, and I would also say like those kinds of exploring competitions are important to do sometimes. Like I still do them. Like what happens if I am just a little more aggressive with my attempt selection in this competition? Well, that didn't work so well. So, <laughs> so we'll learn our lesson and go back to the the other way, you know, so it's important to, to know what your objectives are for each competition that you do and, you know, kind of go in with that in mind and keep it in mind too. Um, in that particular case, you know, I went into a comp, I did go into a competition kind of thinking, you know, what happens if I'm a little bit more aggressive with my attempt selection and I did miss some attempts and didn't feel great about it afterwards, you know, but if you think about it in the bigger picture of, of things, like that was the objective was to go in and, and try something and you try something that you think is going to work. Cause it'd be kind of weird to try something expecting it to fail. Um, so there's kind of that disconnect from, you know, the expectation and, and the actual result that we got, but you know, with a little bit more time and perspective on it, I go, well, I mean, that's still a win overall because I, I learned something from the experience and that was the intent behind that competition. Now, if you try something like that at the nationals or the world championship or something like that, that's not the time, you know, but you would go into those scenarios with a different set of objectives too. So. Yeah. Well, and the one benefit is you throw off all the scouting reports, you know, when you do meets <laughs> like that, you know, just make your win ratio look a lot lower. Uh, so that is a tactic. Um, but <laughs> that's a very you know, committed tactic. <laughs> for sure. I paid for this in travel just to throw a third attempt, you know, now, um, you know, one of the things I think about too is um, like, Gabby, you brought up like, what do you do in the moment for the athlete? And I think if I reflect back on my previous meets and times that things haven't gone the way that I've wanted them to, and I start going into like problem solving mode for what I'm going to do with like writing training for the next six months or something like that, it's usually because I feel like I don't have power or control because I thought I was going to get this lift and I didn't get it. So what can I control? Well, apparently I can't control the day. I can't control the attempt selection. So I'm just going to start thinking ahead because I can control that. That's like me mentally. That's where my brain goes is like, what can I control? And I don't think that that's uncommon. I think that's actually quite a, quite a common occurrence for athletes when meets don't go the way that they want them to. They immediately think about problem solving in the future because they, the rest of the day could be completely out of control. But I think that that can be a detrimental thing in the moment to your point, Gabby, of like, hey, you still have two other disciplines to go. Like you still need a bench and you still need a deadlift. And if you're thinking about what you're going to do for the next six months for the next beat, well, there's a time and place for that. There's a debrief for a reason. And what I found to be really useful for my athletes is to give them that space, right? To say like, listen, we're going to have a pre-meet meeting. We're going to create our plan. We're going to have the attempt selection plan, but we're going to have a debrief meeting afterward to talk about what our plan is and what our learnings are. But until then, your goal for today is to just do, right? It's to just put yourself in the mental space that you need to be in to execute on your movements. And at the same time, you have to give people the space to feel what they're feeling, right? Like, hey, you're frustrated because you missed two squats or you missed a, your, your last squat. Okay, cool. It's, it's okay to be frustrated. Anybody would be frustrated with that. But looking at the time, we need to start warming up for bench. So using the tactic that Susie Gary used, which I think is outstanding, I'm going to go get some water or I'm going to go to the scoreboard or whatever it is. When I come back, we need to start moving. So we're going to get out of this whirlwind of thoughts and emotions and we're going to get right at it, you know? And I think that that is important. Like it's giving space for that emotion. It's giving space for the frustration. It's not like shoving it down because then you spend a lot of mental energy trying to shove it down. And that usually just leaks out. I think, um, that's been my, uh, perception 
and also perception of other athletes as well. So I think giving people the space to feel that and helping them to then transition and compartmentalize those feelings and then to transition into the next thing is the, the right way to go. And it sounds like you did that, Gabby, you know, um, and, and I think, you know, Mike, uh, it sounds like Susie did that for you too, in, in a couple of different ways with her tactics, but I, I, it is hard because we're passionate about this thing, right? And the more that you do it, the more passionate you get at it, the more you're trying to uncover the secrets of powerlifting and training, and you're trying to figure this stuff out. And when things don't go your way, it's natural to immediately go toward, well, what did I do wrong or what could I have done differently? Right. And I think uh, what's really worked well for me is to go back to the athlete and say, we're going to have a space to talk about that, but it's not right this second. Yeah. Kenny, I keep uh, kind of coming back to you for the uh, like larger team perspective, but I think it's because you're, you know, that's your more recent experience, but uh, um, is there kind of a, a difference in how you would handle that in kind of a larger team setting versus, you know, your more of a, your work with your one-on-one -on -one, uh, clients? As far as kind of how to keep them focused or approach yeah. when something doesn't go to plan. Yeah. Uh, to the degree that I can, it, is similar for anyone in a team setting versus in an individual setting. But like I said, there's sometimes it, like a division of, of, of work where they're, they're going to prefer to go to the friend for some, some like comfort after a mislift and then they'll get back in the game. Uh, it's not something that happens super frequently, which I'm thankful for that that's something that goes yeah. like, wildly sideways uh because most of the time my uh risk aversion shows up and i'm like you're you're opening lighter sorry <laughs> uh, or we're gonna avoid putting ourselves in a potentially like vulnerable position here because it's going to feel worse for you to have this you know this problem than it is to you know absolutely smash your your third attempt your second attempt or whatever and have it be a little bit too easy and then you can go in the uh, warm up room or next day you go to the gym or practice or whatever and just send it there. I'd rather have you have a good meet experience, especially when most of our, our lifters are competing for the first time with the team. I'd, I'd rather have that happen. Um, but I guess the, the example that was going through my mind uh, in a team setting when you guys are talking about, you know, missed attempts or, or how to kind of deal with weird things happening during a meet. It's 2021 collegiate nationals. And one of our lifters was almost thrown out, uh, not for anything that they did like wrong in terms of like conduct, but they were injured and I was helping handle them. And so they just took the bar for squats and they were just going to take a plate for, for deadlift, but they wanted to stay in the meet because they were going to try for an American record on bench. And it was going to be a limit lift. Like it was going to, it was a real toss up of like whether or not they would have it in them. So the attempts were already planned. They went through the first two attempts, about three lifters out. The jury stops our entire platform. So they stop even the, the couple lifters beforehand. People are getting like really antsy, like in the, in the back of the warm, like, or the like waiting area behind the platform. People are like, what's going on? Every coach is like frustrated because we're not getting communication. And the lifter, Kid, like, senses this and he's like dude what is going on and like starts getting like upset and I'm like hey like we're gonna fix this you need to stay in your zone like you did not come this far to get this close to get taken out of your zone and miss the lift for something that you can't control because you weren't focused like put your headphones back on we'll, we'll fix this you're gonna get your attempt let's do this and unfortunately he missed the the lift but it was it, it was very close and it was, and that was kind of like what we expected. Like he got his like honest effort toward it, but they, the, the reason that he was almost like uh, disqualified is because they didn't think his lifts were like bona fide three lift attempts. They thought he was just going to try to kind of like break a single lift record in a three lift meet. And so we didn't even know that until like way, way later, but it was a very kind of challenging circumstance and just took a little bit of like, 
you need to focus on 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 you right now and he's able to do that yeah definitely that's why you want a handler in place so that you can kind of have that separation of mental energies yeah. so what types of lessons i suppose is a fairly broad question uh but just to kind of take us more into the direction of training and preparation. Um, so what types of, what things are you looking for uh, in a competition setting that you then bring back with you uh, to a training environment? So, I mean, I think maybe the, the classic one that I always thought about uh, is just kind of looking at, uh, looking at the attempts, in particular the third attempt, and uh, keeping an eye out for technical breakdowns and things like that, and using that to feed back into the uh, into the training process, which is a thing and it does happen. Um, it doesn't happen quite like I imagined it, kind of in the beginning of uh, my coaching career. It's not so much like you look at the one max lift or your third attempt as like this isolated thing, it, you know, these days, I think we all probably try to take it more holistically. Um, but that's kind of the, the classic uh, thing that we bring back into training. But I suppose this really kind of connects into, John, what you were talking about with your uh, debriefing process after the competition's over. What other things do you find often come up um, as part of that conversation. So one of the things that can be really useful is to use a pretty simple heuristic of start, stop, and continue, which is pretty common a uh, way that we talk to our athletes about how training is going and what are some things that we might want to do differently. We could do the same thing when we debrief about a meet right? So we can sit back and we can say, okay, so based on the way we prepared for this meet, think about the meet card, think about the, you know, attempt selection, all the things that we've put in, even you know, we talk about training too, or technique. What are some of the things that we want to start, stop and continue? And it, I like getting that perspective from the athlete because there are things that I may not be aware of as the coach. I may not be aware of and hopefully Kenny's okay with me sharing this. Him and I just did one today and literally just before this. And one of the things that Kenny had shared with me was how engaged he felt on the day of the meet, like how he felt as he was competing at collegiate nationals and like the, just the experience of excitement or not being excited. That's important information because maybe there's something we need to do about the taper. Maybe there's something we need to do about the attempt selection. Maybe there's something we need to do about just our preparation ahead of time. Like when we meet and we talk about our goals and our selection or, or the broader training for the next six months or eight months or whatever it is, we, there's things we probably need to talk about. I would not have known that unless I asked the question and unless he told me, right? Because I'm not in his body and I don't know that, you know, maybe he's feeling like, oh, I just want to get squat out of the way. Like, I want to know that that's important to know. Why do you want to get squat out of the way? Maybe you're just feeling beat up or maybe you're just not seeing the kind of progress that you want, or, or maybe you're just really excited to get to the bench. I, I don't know, but it's important to know because maybe there's actual interventions that as a coach that I can use to help in that scenario. So that's like one small tactic that I'll use in those debrief conversations. Yeah. I've got a lifter who struggles with depth you know i mean i've been working with him for years it's just always a struggle you know and it'll be fine for a while and then gradually it'll the problem kind of sneaks back in so it seems like uh competition is always a good recalibration you know it thankfully we don't often have trouble with it depth anymore you know in competition uh settings but it may come up that like oh i had to be more conscious of it than i thought i was going to have to be or something like that so um 
usually something like that might be a cue for us to kind of refresh our our perspective and we might emphasize some things like uh, slower eccentric squatting or or pause squatting or something like that just to uh, give a little bit more emphasis to those positions that might be a thing that comes up I see things like that often you know that that may not be quite to the level where it's going to come up as a technical fault that's getting you red lights in competition or you know maybe not what you would typically think of as like this is your weakness but it's it's more qualitative than that and it's reliant on you know the information we have leading up to the competition because we're working together and we see our training videos and everything every week and then you know his subjective experience in the competition is that hey i had to be more conscious of it it took more effort than i feel like it ought to have taken so uh, we should make this an emphasis item again so Things like that, I think that's kind of the connection that I see with what you said, John, is just the the opportunity to bring in some qualitative uh, things as well. You know, the quantitative stuff is great, uh, but that's just not the only thing that there is. Well, one of the other things to consider I'm just, again, going back to my recent conversation with Kenny today of, yeah, we looked at the numbers of how the last development block went. There's the numbers of what he did at collegiate nationals, but then there's how he felt about it. That's important. Cool. You know, like there's the, the, the qualitative component is as important as the data, in my opinion. And the other thing too, is you mentioned like movement quality. Certain things happen with high intensity, you know, leaving zero kilos off the bar like Kenny did on his third attempt deadlift. And that provides very high fidelity information about some things that we need to do to keep getting that pattern better. Um, Competitions provide that because we don't always work up to an at 10 RPE on our deadlift, you know. And when we do, that provides information about how we might want to structure training. One other example that I was thinking of too, that I was going to pitch over to Gabby and Kenny is, have you ever had lifters who maybe didn't have the highest validation of their RPEs? They didn't have the highest self-awareness around what their single out of eight was. And then the competition leaves an opportunity for them to become very aware of that. Um, how, and how, if you have, how have you structured that with your lifters, that conversation? Uh, so I'm going to go first, uh, if that's okay. Uh, so I had an athlete, um, who like, when we started, she was, uh, I perceived her as a lifter who didn't take risks at all. Um, and she was overall very conservative with her loads, uh, selections during training. So the first competition, um, we went there to go for nine for nine just to have fun. And then during the second competition, uh, which was like half a year later, there was like a huge change uh, in her energy because we got her to um, become more confident over time. And during her competition prep, I kept telling her, okay, take the risks. Um, also during the, uh, during the competition, We're going to get a little risky. Um, So actually the reason why she um, wasn't confident when when she started is because she had a background of um, multiple disc herniations when she was a teenager. So so all of this affected affected her as an athlete, like how she approaches her training. And over time, she um, really had a switch there. And... So actually, like, it was really funny because we never really got to experience her full RP tens up until like close to the competition and also at the platform, which was really cool to see because then we got to see that she can actually grind. Um, So this was really, um, really surprising. But yeah, it was great to see. And then afterwards, uh, like the the switch that we also got to see because she noticed it herself that she was also capable of a lot more um, than the following block. Like even her bench, like um, especially her bench started to skyrocket because like she just took more risks, more risks than usual. And 
like her whole approach was so different. So also like the way you approach training can definitely impact your, your progress. Yeah, it's amazing to me that people, <laughs> there are people out there that don't see it that way. But I, of course, I fully agree with you on that. But uh, it's interesting. I like the wording that you chose there of taking more risks in training. You know, that I think that's right on for the psychology that you see a lot of lifters bringing um bringing to their training is that uh, we were having a conversation about this uh in our our tactics uh meeting the other day that um some lifters just are very cautious with their load selection and sometimes there's a good reason for that uh, but sometimes it's not such a good reason or it used to be a good reason but it's not anymore you know it, it could be any number of things uh, but how do you broach those conversations with athletes because you know sometimes there can be a bit of defensiveness around this and it goes in both directions like hey uh you know we're supposed to be doing a single at eight and that's looking more like a single at 10 you know or we're supposed to be doing a single at eight and it looks like you're hanging out around a six you know that the, they're very different conversations but you know I've had athletes in both scenarios. It can can be a little bit. Maybe I'm not sure if it's them being defensive about it, or or I'm just not approaching it in the best way, you know. So there's definitely a give and take from a a coach and athlete relationship standpoint there, or you know, it's got to you've got to communicate, right? But Kenny, I, I think uh, you were about to say something, and I jumped in again but <laughs> that's that's okay i uh, i was just gonna say i tried to sidestep a little bit of the defensiveness i think sometimes I, it can be perceived as like you're doing rp wrong and you should feel bad about this like i don't want the, that to be the perception <laughs> uh but especially in competition prep you know a, a lifter has what a single at eight for example or something and they do something and they show it to me and they're like dude look at this like this is great and it is like they did a good job, but it's not innate from the perspective of picking attempts. And so I'll try to reframe it as like this, like you're, you hit everything on, on the nose as far as like execution, but I think you have like five more kilos left in you after this lift. Maybe you could have done two more reps. And so from the view of like RP mixed with reps and reserve, I believe you, but from the perspective of picking your openers and picking attempt selection, here's what I'm seeing. Does this make sense to you? Like, what are your thoughts around this? And sometimes we're actually in complete agreement. And they're like, oh yeah, uh, like I, I'll call it an RP8, but I, I know that uh, it's not like an RP8 in the competition setting. And so then we are able to make intelligent kind of selections uh, around that. Uh, the only other part that like sometimes I think lifters see an estimated wander around and they're like, Oh, that means I can hit this. Sometimes like it, it's an estimate and uh, similar reframing has to go into place where it's like for reps. Yeah. You're that's what your E1RM shows, but there's a lot more to the competition than just an estimated wander at max. Yeah. Well, I was just going to follow ahead, up on that one. Uh, so do you find that, because there's a couple of different ways you can go about this, right? So you can take the approach that you took, which is sort of non-confrontational, asking questions, exploring the situation, and helping the athlete to sort of self-discover that. But you're also instituting your own opinion in there too, which I think is important as a coach. You could also choose, depending on the lifter, to not do that and to let them self-discover and that might actually be the right answer for certain people, right? So they go to meet, they're telling you it's a single at an eight, and you've tried to have some conversation about it. Maybe they're closed minded about it. And, and I've certainly had this happen in which then the learning opportunity needs to be when they learn that it's not a single at an eight. And that's, that's a tough thing to have happen. 
But sometimes people need that in order to say, you know, I probably wasn't doing a single out of eight. I probably wasn't doing that. And this is a learning opportunity. So finding that balance of like self-discovery, self-exploration, which we want to do that as coaches, we do want to encourage our athletes for exploration. That's, that's an important component of being an athlete, right? Finding your own technique, finding your own attempt selection plan, finding the way that you structure training. We want athletes to be uh, empowered to, to explore those things. But at the same time, we don't want to load something up on their opener that they're going to fail, right? So there, there is this fine line. So I'm curious, uh, Kenny, have you navigated those waters a bit or, or Gabby? And have you led athletes like take something that you think may not be successful out of me to give them the learning opportunity or a mock meet or something like that? I, I wonder if I like some of my athletes kind of get like self-selected, like filter out because I don't tend to gravitate toward that way of doing things. Like I'm, I'm going to be honest or we're going to have some discussion, but every once in a while there is a lifter where it's like, okay, you, we can do it this way. Uh, and we'll talk through kind of the, the risks or I might even tell them what I think is going to happen. I'm like, it's going to get to your knees and it's going to go back down. And they're like, no, let me try it. And that's fine. Like, it's not usually like a, a negative thing. It's like, sure. You're like, you, you already got your first attempt. Like, let's, let's go for this and see what happens. And then what I said sometimes happens or sometimes they prove me wrong too. And that's like great information as well. And uh, the instances where they fail, it, it gives us a, a talking point after the meet to go, okay, like here's what's going on. Here's how we might reframe this or pick a different strategy for our training in order to address this. I just recently had this happen with an athlete this week where we were looking at attempt selection for an upcoming meet. And I looked at the lifters data on open powerlifting and said, right now you have a very low success rate of making third attempt deadlifts and gave the percentage, gave the amount. And I said, if we look at your training that you were doing at this period of time, your estimates were this, and this is what you went for. Based on that, we may want to, if we want to get to the 500 dot score, if we want to get to these numbers, we might want to open a little lighter. And so that actually was like a really good in for me to use data to help explore the situation and sort of raise doubt for the lifter uh, because that lifter tends to be like, no, I've got it. <laughs> and it's like, well, well, maybe not, you know, but you also don't want to go at them that way either because that could be a negative reaction as well. So I, I found that to be a useful strategy. I wanted to share that uh, because that was one that just came up recently. Um, Gabby, how about you? Do you have you had any opportunities like this and how have you navigated it, helping lifters to kind of see maybe the single at eight is a little so more than the single at eight So I have an athlete less. who um, tends to often overestimate himself uh, especially when it comes to bench. Um, the thing is, like, sometimes athletes, they see that the estimated one rep maxes, they climb up, especially, like, when they look at it after a set of, like, four or even more reps because then it tends to become less more accurate um, of a prediction of what they can actually do. Um, so, yeah, but sometimes from time to time, especially when they do singles um, or, like... Um, to be specific, this athlete, um, you just like you you just um, reality hits at some point. So you just have to learn it the hard way when it doesn't work the way you you thought it would work out. And then, like what I just do is like we have a we sit down, we have a talk. Uh, what helps is to reflect the block and uh, see. Okay, it definitely went in the right direction, but sometimes. Um, you just um, like you just tend to to take the the big the heavy loads too early and then you you lose momentum. So just just learning how to approach the training um, in a different way um, in order to to make progress on a longer term uh, in the next blocks. So just sit down, reflect on it, have a talk, and al always be realistic with um, especially with him. It really helps to. To be realistic, really um, tell him what's going on and not not sugarcoat anything because yeah. that's not what he needs. So, yeah. 
Yeah, I would totally agree. I think that, I think, well, I should speak for myself, I guess, that I, I do have my natural inclination is to be a bit more reserved in some of my comments to athletes, uh, especially around these types of things. Um, lots of times that's not really necessary that they're most of the time athletes want feedback from their coach. Like that's why they have a coach. I mean, you do need to be tactful about it and, uh, um, you know, that can be, that can range uh, pretty widely, but having some actual feedback, I, I don't often get like really negative responses to the feedback that I provide. Sometimes there's a bit, but it usually opens up a conversation more than anything else. You know, like, Hey, uh, that's not looking like an eight RPE to me. It's looking like we're overshooting by a fair bit. And, you know, maybe they push back and say, uh, no, I'm confident that I could do, you know, another two reps with this or something like that. And they say, well, okay, you know, maybe we'll have an opportunity to, to see that at some point. And, you know, maybe we can construct that into the training. And I mean, that's important for me to learn too, if that's, if that is true, you know, so there's some sort of calibration that needs to happen. Either I need to update my maps or they need to update their maps. Uh, but something needs to, to happen for us to get on the same page. Um, I do think uh, velocity is useful there, but I think that's maybe a, a topic. It's a whole other topic all its own. And I know that we're kind of bumping up against our time limits here today, but uh, um, I suppose that's a good a place as any for us to, to wrap this up. But uh, Gabby, Kenny really appreciate uh, the, the perspective that you guys have on this and, um, really happy to talk training with you. Looking forward to a lot more uh, training conversations with you. And uh, again, happy to to have you on the team. John, as always, thanks for being here. And uh, for everybody watching and listening, thanks for being here as well. And we'll see you next time.